Welcome, welcome, welcome. Here we are on part two of our discussion on coaching culture. I have a very special guest today. I have Coach uh, Derek Jones, Coach DJ Cheetah on Twitter, and he is an excellent resource when it comes to talking about culture and diversity in sports. He is now the associate head coach at Texas Tech University and spent the last 12 years of his career at Duke University. Welcome, Coach Jones. Hey, how are you? I appreciate you having me on. Doing well, doing well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just chit-chatting before the show and getting to know Coach Jones even better. Um, you, you were talking about your daughter. How many children do you have? I have three daughters, as a matter of okay. fact. And they are 28, 21, and 12. Oh, okay. So got a nice little gap a, there. I got a big gap between all three of them. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about Coach Jones. Who is Coach Jones? Well, Coach Jones, I am from a small town, Woodruff, South Carolina. And um, I played my college football at the University of Mississippi. Um, After playing at the University of Mississippi, I played a couple of years of professional ball, Arena League football, Canadian football, but I knew that I didn't want to do that long term. So I kind of fell into coaching. Um, I never thought about being a coach. I actually went to college uh, to be a lawyer. And that's what I studied, criminal justice, political science. But, you know, sometimes people see things in you that you don't see in yourself. And one of my college coaches told me that he thought I needed to be a coach and he actually offered me a position. And uh, upon thinking about it, I took the position and I was able to return to the University of Mississippi as a graduate assistant. And I was there for a year and a half, Uh, was able to work under David Cutcliffe, who I've worked for for the last 12 years at Duke. But after being a graduate assistant at the University of Mississippi, I went on to Murray State University in Kentucky and spent five years there on the Joe Panangio, was at Middle Tennessee State University um, at the University of Tulsa in 2006, which is where I met Coach Matt Wells, who I work for now here at Texas Tech University, and Coach Keith Patterson, who I worked alongside as um, co-defensive coordinators. After that, I went to the University of Memphis, and I was there for a season before I went to Duke University at 2008 uh, with David Cutcliffe, and I was there up until February. And as I told you, I've got three daughters. I've got two grandkids and I will be married 20 years, um, July 22nd. Wow. Happy anniversary coming up. My anniversary is July 10th. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. That's a good That's the <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So tell, you were telling me about the small town that you grew up in and how like everybody kind of stayed there. It made me think a little bit about Rand University. You know how Randy Moss could describe, like, you know, nobody really leaves the town that he grew up in. So is it kind of like where people stay there or there's not a lot of, um, is it a very small population where everybody knows everybody? Yeah, it's a very small population. We were a double A high school um, and everybody goes through the same school all the way through. There are no feeder schools. I mean, you're in kindergarten together. You're in primary, elementary, middle school and high school together. And You know, everybody go to the same four or five churches and uh, everybody know each other. Everybody's moms went to school together. Everybody's grandmothers, you know, each other. So it's kind of one of those type communities. And, you know, you have people who go on to college and go to the military and get away. But for the most part, the nucleus of the place is still there. And it's just one of those places where you didn't have a lot of people as I grew up, you know, going to college and doing things um, that you see people doing in bigger towns and bigger cities. So anytime something like that happened, you know, it was like a wow factor. And, you know, luckily I was able to clamp on somebody that I saw that in to be able to have those own aspirations for myself. Okay. Okay. So how have you developed the ability to connect with athletes that you have right now? Like when I see your tweets and I see the interactions that you, you have with kids, it's like very rare you know, every coach doesn't necessarily focus as much on the relationship part and, you know, the education part like you do. Where did you well, pick that? I think um, 99% of that comes from um, my own father. You know, I was fortunate enough to have a present father in my household all while I grew up and um, he's still alive to this day. And my dad was um, always the best example of what to be. You know, um, I can reflect on how my dad raised us. Um, Probably the most important thing is how I saw my father treat my mother all of my life. And my dad was just that guy that, you know, everybody came to for their problems. You know, we had a big extended family. You know, he had double digit 
siblings and my mother had, it was seven of them. But, you know, my dad was just the person that everybody came to. And dad and mom were both pillars in the community. My mom owned a beauty shop you know, in town. And my mom was the lady that everybody went to that had problems. I can't calculate the amount of times as a kid I was standing in that beauty shop and had to go outside, you know, just because people had to talk. <laughs> and when I got older, I realized, you know, probably what a lot of those conversations were. And it's people to this day that are my age that are very thankful for being able to pour into both of them. But, you know, my dad was very big on education, you know, and my dad was a person that was always present. You know, if he'd get off work at four o'clock, he'd make it to wherever we were playing, regardless of what time he got there, he was going to be there when the game was over. And Oftentimes, my dad was the only father that was there, you know, for my other friends um, that were playing along with me. So a lot of who I am is just mimicking him because that's all I knew. And oftentimes I compared coaches that I had that didn't bring those aspects of life to the table to my father. You know, naturally, my father's never been a sports coach of any kind, but that's kind of the way I look at um, leadership. You know, we're coaches by title, but we're leaders by trade. And I feel like there's one way to lead. And um that's by creating bonds with people. And I realized that when people create bonds with you, they will sacrifice more for you. And, you know, just being a walking example myself of the power of education and the power of um, looking beyond your ability, I feel like it's my obligation in this position to give that to people because guys think shallow minded. I thought shallow minded when I was their age. But, you know, when you're 45, 46 years of age and you think about, where you were at 18, 19, it's comical <laughs> to think about how much you know now and how much you didn't know then. But oftentimes I'm the only voice these young men have to get those type of um, nuggets and that type of information. So I realize the classroom don't teach those things. I realize personally that a large majority of coaches aren't going to teach those things. So that's why I've taken it upon myself to use social media to try to be able to get some of those things through to young people because I feel like anytime we're granted with wisdom, it's our responsibility to be able to share that with others. Right. And so how has culture and um, diversity played a part in in that process for you? Like, do you find that there are certain things that your um, minority athletes need that are extra in addition to what you are? You feel the need that that you feel that some of your, you know, Caucasian athletes might need per se? Yeah, with Without a doubt, you know, I think um, anytime you're in a position like I'm in, you're dealing with a large majority of minority students. And the first thing you have to think about uh, when you're talking about not minorities is stereotypes, uh, because stereotypes do exist. You know, I've been on the receiving end of stereotypes um, throughout my life. I've seen others on the receiving end of stereotypes throughout my life. But I realize that st stereotypes are present and they're going to be present. And whether it's fair or not, People need to be educated on what these stereotypes are so that they don't make some of the mistakes, you know, not knowing that they're actually making the mistakes because a kid can dress a certain way, talk a certain way, write a certain way, and he's going to be labeled or judged in a lot of situations that may cost him an opportunity or may not give him a chance to get an opportunity. But if nobody's ever educated them on that, how would they know that? So knowing these things from my own life experiences and seeing these things in my life experiences, I try to share these things with these young men because I understand the importance of being successful past, you know, your playing days. And I realize that people will, will, will enable you as long as you are of use to them. But once you're not from an athletic standpoint, then, you know, you're no longer of use to them. But those are oftentimes the most important times of your life because that's when you do become a husband. That's when you do become a father. That's when you do have responsibilities and mortgages. And that's when you're working a normal job. You're not on scholarship. Or if you're fortunate enough to play professional football, that aspect is over with and you're not getting those type of checks no more. So there are tons of things that I look at and I'm very transparent, you know, with my minority kids about I'm teaching you the importance of being a minority because that's what I am. And I've walked in those shoes and I've seen those things. So again, I think that's the blessing of being a minority in this position, that these are things that I can give to kids that are like me and that came up like me that may not get them otherwise. Have you ever had like a situation, I know you do recruiting, have you ever had a situation to where there was a recruit and in the coaching meetings, perhaps, this kid was about to get overlooked because of some of those cultural issues and you had to interject to offer a different perspective? Oh, all the time, you know, especially now with the presence of social media, being very active on um, several social media outlets. 
I get those phone calls. I get those text messages. I get those inboxes from parents all the time because a lot of mothers in particular just don't know. But I also get them from coaches. I also get them from high school teachers who say, you know, listen, I tried to tell him that and he didn't listen to me. I'm so glad you said that. Or would you talk to him and tell him that because he's not listening to me? So I've kind of opened up myself for that for probably the last eight or 10 years. And I welcome it because oftentimes I do realize kids get to the point to where they're 16, 17 years of age and they're getting a little bit of attention from the recruiting standpoint. So that stubbornness and that ego can cause you not to listen to your mom or your dad. Or it can cause you not to listen to your high school coach because you've got X amount of offers. But, you know, I'm more than glad to do that on any occasion just because I understand the importance of it. And that's the way I coach my own guys as well. Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about coaching um, and the, the cultural issues that exist there. I've been doing a lot of reading and one thing that I noticed is I was reading an NCAA article and it said that about 94% of Caucasian male athletes graduate from college compared to about 80% of African-American male um, athletes that graduate from college. So there's about a 14% disparity between white athletes that graduate and black athletes that graduate. In addition to that, there was a study that showed that Black athletes who are coached by Black coaches have a higher rate of graduation. So even with that data being there, it still seems that there is a huge shortage of African-American and minority coaches in the NCAA. Um, what has been your experience with that? You know, even when I got into coaching, I was told by a coach um, verbatim that there was a shortage of people like me in the profession. And this was back in the late 90s when he approached me about possibly becoming a coach. And um, he was a white coach who told me that. And um, I'm very grateful to him to this day for seeing that because I think he also knew the things that people look for when they're looking to hire a black coach. And it's so crazy because I think back on it and the things that he said to me is, well, you were a good captain. You were a good leader. You've got good communication skills. So I go back to the stereotype things of, you know, what they look for um, in blacks to be if they're going to put them in roles like this. But again, I go back to, you know, just my upbringing and that of my father. I feel like it's my responsibility to be a father figure to every man that I coach, whether he be black or white, because I realize I'm getting these young men in a very, very transitional part of their life. You know, once we get them, they don't go back home. You know, it's four or five years with us and they're either on to the NFL, they're on to the professional realms. But if they go back and lay on mom and dad's couch, you know, something has gone drastically wrong. And this is when they mm -hmm. transition into being hus husbands, being fathers and being professionals themselves. So I think it's very important, you know, in my role and in my seat to teach these guys the things that the sport of football and the things that the subjects that you take in a classroom don't teach them. And I think being a black man myself is very important to me because a lot of the young men at my position are African-Americans. So a lot of times, oftentimes, that's what my room is filled with. And they come from all different walks of life. A lot of my young men don't have present fathers. You know, a lot of my young men are egotistical. And if you put these kids on pedestals throughout the recruiting process from the time they're 15, 16, 17 years of age, and that can cause you not to listen to instruction. And I realize that firsthand because I'm not perfect. And I can remember my own ego as a young age, you know, thinking that I knew more than my parents knew. And so I always try to think like they think. And I always try to recall on how I thought when I was that age. But I realized the power of education. I also realized that, you know, 90 percent of the young African-American men that play the sport, their dream is to go to the NFL. And half of those dream of going to the NFL thinks the NFL is the end of life as far as finances are concerned. And that's not the case. So I take it upon myself to try to teach these young men that you may be fortunate enough to go to the NFL, but at some point in time, you're going to have to work. Whether you're working for somebody else or whether you're fortunate enough to own your own business, you're going to have to have more tools to equip yourself. I mean, just yesterday we were talking to a young man here and one of the coaches asked the young man what was the most important thing to him in looking for a school. And he said, well, coach, you know, really all I want to do is take care of my mother. 
And when it came mm -hmm. my time to talk to him, I was very excited because I wanted to make him understand. I understand you want to take care of your mother. I commend you for wanting to take care of your mother. But guess what, son? One day you're going to be a husband and father yourself. You have to think long term. You have to think outside of the box. You have to think about when your body is no longer in the position to be able to take hits or give hits, when you can no longer catch a ball or run a ball. That's the most critical time of your life because that's when you really have to make educated, rational decisions. That's when you start having to worry about saving for college tuition for your own children. That's when you have to start worrying about paying for weddings for your own children and paying a mortgage and splitting the responsibility between you and your spouse. And these are just all things that we have as adult knowledge, be we black or white, that these young kids need. And as I said, they don't have a class to teach these young people this. So you have to step outside the realm and you have to be able to pull them aside and you have to take time in your own meetings. You have to make your own phone calls to be able to talk to these guys about that. And it's like parenting. It's not a one time thing. You can't write a paper and hand it out to them and expect them to read it and expect them to understand that. And again, I just refer back to myself and I know how hard headed I was, <laughs> you know, as a youngster. And I consider myself to be a very mature person now. And I've been relatively successful in the profession, but my mind was not where it is when I was these young men's age. And I realized when I was in college and I was captain of the team and I was on the track team and I was a fraternity guy, I realized what that popularity did to me. I realized what the esteem that I got from the fan base gave to me. It makes you feel invincible and you don't really need anything because everybody gives you everything. Everything is handed to you and you don't understand that the people that are asking you for autographs, the people that are asking you to take pictures with their kids, the people that are asking you to come by their tents after a game, these people don't call you 20 years later to ask can they pay your mortgage. These people are not asking to help you with your bills. These people are not asking to put money in your account to save for your children's college tuition. So I just try to share my own life experiences with these young men, and I hope that, you know, they gain from it. And what I try to do is to be able to use people that I've coached that are closer to their age as examples of the things that I taught them. Because I realize being 46, a 19 year old thinks he knows more than I do. I hear it all the time. I can see the faces that they give me. I can see them when they smack their lips. I, 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 can, I noticed the whatever look because I used to have that look. But if I go get a guy that's 27, 28 that I coached that was just like him, and now this guy is making six figures and he's not in the NFL, they kind of give you the wow factor. You know, I'm the old guy that doesn't know a whole lot and says the same thing all the time. Even my own child told me a few weeks ago. She said, I don't come out here and talk to you no more because all you do is lecture me. <laughs> and I get that. I understand that. So you have to be a person that's consistent and not only teaching the things that are going to help them be successful on the field. You have to be consistent in teaching them the things that are going to help them be um, successful in life. Because when I'm judged by my career. It's not going to be about a ring. It's not going to be about a trophy. It's not going to be about a jacket. It's going to be about the effect and the impact that I had on people's lives. And when you get those Father's Day calls from guys that you coach and they just say thank you and you get those inboxes and you get those posts, that lets you know you're on the right path. But I think a trickle down effect in coaching is being able to use people that you've taught these lessons to to be able to teach these lessons to others. And that's the kind of the fraternity that you build in the coaching profession. Right. Each one, teach one. Each one, teach one. Uh-oh. Okay, there you go. So when you said that you bring in a guy who makes six figures but is not on the football field, you good? Can you hear me? I lost your sound. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't hear you. <laughs> okay. Um. Let's see. It might be on your end. Something. Um, on my end, it's okay. But yeah, Coach Jones is giving us some great, great nuggets here. Um, one of the things that he said is about the kids that 99% that want to go to the NFL but in reality, about 1% of them are going to be the ones that actually make it. Right. I'm back. Can you hear me, Coach? Yeah, I can hear you. I was making the point. You said that 99% of the kids have that dream to make it to the NFL. 
But from what I understand, about 1% of those kids or a very small percentage actually make it. And even those that do make it, the average NFL career is one to three years. Yes. So what are they going to do after that? You know, and, and, it, it, <laughs> it's, hard, it's hard to get them to realize that because you have to understand who their role models are. You have to understand who they look up to. They don't show you um, on commercials. They don't show you through endorsements the guy that's been trying to make a team for the last five years and is actually in the hole from the money that he's got from ages. You know, they don't show you the guy that um, is trying to struggle to get his pension, but he's going to get cut just because they don't want to grant it to him because they can take a rookie free agent and do the same thing with. We see the success stories. We see the multimillionaires. We see Dak Prescott deciding whether he wants to take 31 million or wait on exit. We see that. But that's a very, very small percentage of people. You think about it. Think about the top quarterbacks in the NFL right now. You know, you've got Aaron Rodgers, you've got Eli Manning, who just retired, Peyton Manning, who recently retired, Tom Brady, um, you've got Drew Brees. You've got all these men that have played football for double digit years. For every year that these guys stay on a roster, that's hundreds that didn't make it, <laughs> you know, that thought they were going to make it. And that, you know, because they left school after three years, they didn't get a college degree. Or because they left school after three years, they were fortunate enough to play one or two years. But, you know, you break that, you know, million dollar salary down by taxes and live in a million dollar lifestyle and then trying to take care of the people that expect and want you to take care of them. And you expect these checks to be coming for the next 10, 15 years of your life. And all of a sudden they're cut off and you're sitting there. And it looks good that you've got four hundred thousand dollars in the bank. But when you don't make another roster now, guess what? It's hard for you to go take a thirty thousand dollar year job. And every time your buddies call and say, man, let's go to Jamaica or let's go to Vegas. Guess what you do? You go because you can afford to do that. But that's only going to last a small amount of time. But if you've never had anyone to explain these things to you, if you don't have any examples of failure to be able to relate to, you think your story is going to be a success story. And that's why you see almost 80 percent of the men that play professional sports, whether it be um, football or basketball, they're broke after two to three years out of the league. And that's a sad statistic that nobody ever advertises. Right. And, and that goes to like the financial literacy. And especially if you go back to not having the father in the home, you know, no one to teach you about financial literacy, no one to teach you about having that amount of money and what to do with it. Now you get in the league, you have that money, you rack up all of these expenses and now your income on longevity does not sustain the expenses that you have accumulated. Now, most coaches, are they addressing that with their athletes or is it more focused on the on the field play? Well, I think, you know, coaching in itself is such a pressure um, position because these coaches are worried about their own livelihoods and coaching is a very unstable profession. I mean, you can be up here and down here very fast and everybody's trying to climb the ladder of success. So to be honest with you, I don't think a lot of people take time to do that because I think that everybody's concerned about, you know, their own situation. I mean, everything's about winning ball games, you know, with a lot of the people that I know. But for me, I've just never put pressure on myself in that regard. You know, for me, winning is knowing that I'm helping somebody else to put themselves in a winning position. And I've never looked at a sport as a 12 game season. You know, the lessons that I took from sports have nothing to do with my wins and losses. You know, I learned a lot about what to become and what not to become. A lot of my lessons were learned in the locker room by observing my teammates. A lot of my lessons from being a coach now is reflecting on my own coaches, knowing what I wanted more of and what I felt like they should have given me more of. You know, mm. I take the good, but I also look at, you know, how I could have been benefited better by those things. And coaching for me is truly a career. And when you understand the career, it's just like life. There are going to be some ups. There are going to be some downs. You know, I've, I've been fired before. You know, I've been in a situation where we had a good year and I wasn't taken with the coach, so I had to find another job. So you expect bad things to happen, just like you do in life. But you have to be able to deal with adversity, even when you don't know what type of adversity you're going to be faced with. But I also think it's very important that you teach people those things because everybody's not built like that. I realize that a lot of my wit as a man a lot of my um strength as a man comes from my own father i would not be this person if i didn't see that in him 
I can sit here and tell you right now and everybody listening to me, I've never seen my father lose his composure. That's why you'll never see me lose mine. I see guys on the sidelines acting crazy and falling out and going crazy. I'm not doing that because I realize this. Even though I was playing sports as a player, I was always watching my coaches to see how they acted as grown men. And for me, I just don't think it's appropriate for grown men to do so many things. I've never coached in a game, played in a game that had any effect on me weeks or two weeks later. But I don't act like that in my household with my children. So I'm not going to act like that on a field with young men because I'm totally contradicting myself. If I talk about the importance of maintaining your composure as a person, if they see me do just the opposite. So but again, my daddy told me a long time ago. The moment you give somebody the power to make you lose your composure is the moment you give them power over you. Right. One thing we're blessed with is power of ourself. And I'm not giving that to anybody. You know, even mm -hmm. my wife, she looks at me and says stuff all the time. I don't like I just smile at her. <laughs> she wants me to get mad. So I'm definitely not going to let a referee or another coach or somebody get me rattled like that. But I truly honestly believe that we have to be examples in the position that we're in. And the higher you elevate, I feel like it's more of a responsibility to um, act like that because that's a platform that you've been given. And because you have that platform, you must understand that people are looking to you for advice. Like thousands of the people that I reach on a daily basis, I don't know and I'll never meet. I probably know less than 5% of the people that are actually on my Twitter page. But I do realize a lot of people are looking for my every move. I realize some are looking for me to make a mistake. I realize some are looking for me to fail and I have to pass those lessons on to the young men that sit in my room. Somebody is always looking for you to make a mistake so they can say that you're contradicting the, contradicting the words that you say. So, right. again, I just stay back to trying to be an example of what you want others to become. Right. right. With the, the shortage of minority coaches, like you said previously, knowing that even going into coaching, why is there such a shortage of minority coaches in collegiate sports, especially being like I'm looking at this 64 percent of football players are minorities, but only 20 percent of the coaches are minorities? I think the first portion of it is uh, being ignorant to what it takes to become a coach. You know, just dealing with a lot of young men that have played in the NFL um, or played sports. I think a lot of young men think that you can become a coach just because you were good at playing the sport and they're not educated on everything else that goes into it. You know, first and foremost, you know, how much football knowledge do you have? How much football knowledge did you obtain while you were actually playing the game? Were you a guy that was just so talented you didn't know? But I also think it goes back to guys that are talented being enabled not being forced to learn the things that they need to learn. You know, you look at a guy that's not a good guy in the classroom, he's probably not going to be a guy that grasps the playbook very well. But, I mean, if he can run, if he can catch, if he's just that much more athletic, he's going to be successful. And I think a lot of people that go into any profession prepare themselves to go into that profession. And I just think it's a lack of us. Looks like we lost. Oh, okay. We, have, we don't see, nor do we have role models to follow. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing. You know, I know for a fact, you know, being um, a black coach where I'm from, I was one of the first. And uh, my nephew actually just finished being a graduate assistant at Georgia Southern. But in between the two of us, there's nobody because that's something that we've never seen from our communities. That's never something we've never aspired to be. I think that desire to become a professional athlete is there. But very rarely do you see people walk around saying, I want to become a coach. And coaching is who you know uh, when you get to this level. I mean, it's who do you know? Who can get you into this position? And for the longest, we only occupied the mandatory minority positions. I can remember when I played collegiate football, there were not many people with any more than two minority coaches on their staff because I think that was the norm. And when you saw somebody with four minorities on their staff or possibly five, it was a wow factor. Wow. You know, that's unheard of. And I just think those positions are so hard to come by and people just truly lack the knowledge of how to break into the profession. But at the end of the day, you have to have people that are willing to hire in order to be able to spread those seeds. Right. And, and from my perspective, I think that's more of the issue because I know a lot of people who are capable as coaches, 
but are unable to get those, you know, break into the college coaching. I know a lot of people who ended up coaching high school have the football knowledge and are able to get high school coaching jobs, but breaking into the NCAA has been a problem. And even if we look at the 20% minority coaches, that's only for like, that's coaches overall. But if you go to head coaches, it's even lower than that. So with someone like yourself, if it's all about the football knowledge, then you should have a head coaching position by now. But you've been coaching for what, about 15, 16 years? 24. 24 years. And have you ever been um, in the pool for a head coaching position? Not that I know of. <laughs> if I was, they didn't inform me of it. Right. Has it? Have you applied for any head coaching positions? No, um, I've never applied for uh, any head coaching positions because, to be honest with you, I don't even know that process. And to be honest with you, generally applying for a head coaching job is not going to get you in the pool. Um, it's going to be a search firm. It's going to be an athletic director. And I've been in a couple of head coaching um, programs, seminars, and that's the thing that's told, told to you. I mean, you just can't send your application in and think that you're going to get a job. And sadly, most of the time, most people know about who they want to hire when it happens. You know, there right. Are it's so a who, you things. know, like you said, it's a who, who, you know, thing. So by the time the position is posted on the website, they already know who they want for it. So if you don't have the connections in place, it's hard to get your name right. on that list. And you got to think about it. You know, um, when their job changes in our profession, these athletic directors are very smart. They're pros at what they do. And they have uh, headhunters and people to work for. them. You know, when you're at a certain institution. And your head coach is going to be a hot candidate for other jobs. You're already looking. You already have somebody looking for you. And there's a pool of names that these search firms have already to be able to feed to these athletic directors who don't know these names themselves. And if you're not in those circles, it's going to be hard for you to break in there. Very rarely do you see um, a guy like myself just pop onto the scene and all of a sudden become a hot candidate. And I think, you know, the criteria um, for becoming head coaches, there are very few of us in those positions. You know, most people are going to tell you you either have to have been a head coach or a coordinator to qualify for a coaching position. Well, you think about it. There are not many of us blacks that are coordinators and there are not many of us blacks that are head coaches that have been head coaches. So how do we progress? You know, <laughs> our backs against the wall there because we're just not in those positions. So how do people ever even know? the intelligence level that you have? How do they know what you bring to the table if, in fact, you aren't calling plays where you are? There are only so many coordinators in America. So that doesn't mean that everybody that's on a staff isn't capable of being a leader because they're not calling the plays. But, you know, we're only granted the positions that we're granted. And, uh, you know, the thing you do is you just try to work. You try to be an example. And you hope that somebody will one day notice. I mean, I don't know the formula for going out and advertising for myself. <laughs> you know, we're not mm -hmm. taught those things and just being observant in the profession. I don't know if that works or how that works. So it seems like, you know, even if you go up the ladder. So, you know, it's hard to get that head coaching position because the athletic directors are the ones making that decision. And the athletic directors are not majority minority either. And then even if you go to like even the NFL, you have the owners that are not minorities either. So every time you go up the ladder, you're getting less and less minorities who are decision makers. And so it's like you said, how do we progress? How do we progress? And some of it might be to where we have to go to our own universities. Like, what are your thoughts on if we were to try to build up the participation and make the HBCUs more competitive and if they become more competitive, now they can demand the type of money and stipends that are, um, available at power five schools well i think you said the key thing right there and it, it boils down to one thing it's money and and when you look at uh because i've seen a lot of uh, people the last couple of weeks talking about you know our athletes and black athletes should go to hbcus and i think that's a wonderful thought process but you must understand what these young men are giving up from a monetary standpoint you know to make those decisions everything we do in life for the most part is driven by finances and when an institution can provide a guy with X amount of dollars that an HBCU can't, that's tough because a lot of these kids are using this money to help back at home. They're, they're helping mom out with their young brothers and their young sisters or whatever. So there's a lot more that goes into it than meets the eye. 
You know, that's just like asking a guy, you know, that's in the NFL to go take a position in the CFL when he knows he's not going to make as much money. And there's no different for us, you know, um, in this position. Um, when you get to the level that I'm at, we're compensated well um, for that. And there are not a lot of head coaching positions um, that can pay the salary that we're making as an assistant. And so that's kind of how it goes. As these salaries go up in the Power Five, we're entrenched because we're living that lifestyle. We have college tuition for children we have to pay for. And it's tough. And you have to make that decision to say, okay, do I want to give up X amount of dollars to become a head coach? Or do I want to make sure that I can put my children through college? And so it's kind of a double edged sword, you know, in that regard. So a lot of people, just because of what you just said, I think are trapped because and it's not just HBCUs. Even when you look at the lower level of coaching right now, a lot of these schools can't afford to pay these high level assistants at power five schools. And it boils down to money. Wow. I see a comment here. I guess it was when you were talking about the positions already being selected when by the time the position is posted and it says that's why the Rooney rule is BS. <laughs> well, you know, I'm not in the NFL, but, you know, I do think um, the Rooney rule does force uh, the NFL teams to hire minorities that they probably actually don't have any intentions of hiring. Um, I think to interview does, them. Yes. To, to I, interview I them. Mm -hmm. And I think what it does do and that um, because I think when the rule was made, they realized just how the system works. If you are a good general manager, if you are a good athletic director, you are going to have names of people that you've researched. You just don't sit there in that chair and say, OK, if I lose my coach, I'm going to interview random people. None of us in positions like this want to hire people that we don't know their background. We don't know who they are. We don't know what they bring to the table, the strength, the weaknesses and everything else. And it's difficult to hire somebody you don't know in any position over somebody that you do know. I do real, realize that. But I think what the Rooney Rule does, it does allow minorities to get in front of these people to make that introduction. I think it's really more so about making that introduction than actually getting a job. Because some of these guys have in turn got jobs later on in their career by getting in front of that general manager um, that one time. But there is no Rooney Rule in college football. <laughs> right. Right. And even in the NFL, even with the Rooney rule, it's still only about four black coaches, black head coaches. So it's yeah, still, I mean, it's tough. if it's and even you know, that. The ones that are there have been there for a while. And, you know, the ones of us that get those jobs, um, I think the microscope is tougher. You know, and there was a coach out of Arizona um, two years ago that got one year and, you know, and he was fired. And I don't know how or why that happened, but, you know, I think if you, look at it and you ask any minority, we would all agree that we feel like, you know, given the opportunity to get these jobs, we realize that our leash is going to be a little bit shorter. Mm. I think it was, was it, was it um, Tomlin or Lovey Smith that got relieved of head coaching like about a year or two after they were in the um, Super Bowl? That was Lovey Tomlin. He's still in Pittsburgh. Okay, he's been there for a long time. I was, I was blown away. I was like, how do they let him go? Like the year after he was in in the Super Bowl. Well, I don't know exactly how long it was, but again, I, I mean, coaching in itself is a very cutthroat business, and it's a, uh, what have you done for me lately? But sadly, in coaching, oftentimes it comes down to who does that person in charge want? <laughs> you know, right? You have people that you you have people every year in the coaching profession that get hired or fired just because somebody else is available or unavailable. You know, I say it all the time when the coach gets hot, I say somebody's going to get fired because somebody wants this coach because everybody thinks that what's new is what's popular. And you have to look at ticket sales. You have to look at everything that goes into these universities uh, of what they're looking for. And if a young coach is successful, everybody wants a young coach. If an old coach happens to be successful, not everybody wants to go with an older coach. And it's not just us black coaches that get shut out in that area. You know, a lot of older coaches are getting shut out. It's like me for right now. I'm 46 years of age. And I realized just by looking forward in my career that when I'm 56, I'm not going to be the same guy. I'm not going to be as in demand because the profession is getting younger. 
So I'm preparing myself for that. I'm not going to be the person to sit around my lips poked out and say, you know, I'm surprised that this happened to me when I get to that age. But I realize that I'm not going to be as in demand 10 years from now as I am now. So there's just a lot of things that are ingrained in people for what they want. And there's no rules you can put on them to stop them from doing it. Right. Do you think that on some level, like we're held to a higher standard? I think that there's this quote from Scandal. Um, I was something made me look it up the other day and it, the, the Betty Pope told Olivia Pope, what did I tell you? You have to be twice as good to get half as much as what they have. And I feel like that applies sometimes in, in our in the coaching profession, like a, like a person like Lovey Smith, perhaps one of his counterparts, whatever, if he started losing that season, if that was the case, somebody else can lose that much and still have their job. But Lovey Smith, because of being a minority and it's only a few of them, sometimes I think that comes into play that you're judged at a high, at a longer yardstick or shorter yardstick. I'll go even further to say, I just think that's a fact of life, period. I think for us, you know, as minorities, it's going to be tough for, for you to make it in a lot of fields um, just because of the color of your skin. It's been that way. It's been proven. And those are things that I instill and you have to understand. It. It's just what you said. Those are things that I tell my players on a regular basis. You're not going to get second chances because there's so many people that prove what people are saying right that you have to really stand out to prove them wrong and guess what you may not get a second opportunity you may not get a second chance so make that first one count but at the same time don't sit around and cry about it when it happens because i've told you ahead of time you just move on to the other opportunity therefore you have to have everything about you in a position to be able to prove that you're worthy of the position and you know it's life it's the way it is. It's not fair. It's not right. But it's the hand that we're dealt. And, you know, what I refuse to refuse to do is to be an example of making an excuse in that regard. You know, I think any time odds are against you, odds are against you as a woman, whether you're white or black. Let's be honest. That's just the way that it goes. So you have to I have three daughters. I have to teach them. Odds are against you as a woman, especially as a black woman. So these are the things I need to lay out to you. These are the things that I need to tell you. And these are the things I don't want you coming back talking to me about 10 years later that you just discovered when I told you 10 years before. So I think anytime that you know things in life, you just got to prepare yourself to overcome those things. Right, right. It says the high performance business. And I've heard that a million times that this is the high performance business. We don't have the opportunity to make mistakes like a, a pilot. A pilot don't have the opportunity to make a mistake and don't get a second chance. So we got to get it right. We got to get it right every time. So, um, wow. I'm just thinking about like, how do you instill that? So you talked about cheetah law a little bit. Can you tell us how you tie in cheetah law to teaching and instilling these things? Like the set, no second chances that you got to get it right. You got to listen up and you got to do things twice as good to get the opportunities. Yes, uh, I, I think um, having a platform to be able to stand in front of young men um, on a daily basis to be able to talk to them. I use those opportunities to talk about life. And, you know, when I put my cheetah laws up, they're just points of life. And I use those to try to teach them things that have nothing to do with football that they're going to be able to use in life. And I'm trying to instill in things that I want them to be able to instill in their own children one day. And I know these are things that are going to come to play in their life at some point in time, just because life has shown me that these things are going to happen over and over again. So, yes, that's one of the things that I try to teach people all the time. It's no excuses. You can sit around and make all the excuses in the world about what's fair, what's not fair or what shouldn't have happened or what should have happened. But nobody's listening. You know, there are going to be a lot of things that happen to you in life that you can't control. But what you can't control is how you act or react to those things. And those are things that don't come natural to people. And I realize that. And those are things that you have to instill, not once, not twice, but over and over and over again before they get it. And oftentimes they still don't get it until it happened, but they're better prepared for it because they've heard it from you um, those times. You know, I never start a meeting off with football. I start every single meeting that I hold with my kids about something that life has presented whether it be something that happened in society, whether it be something I think has happened, whether it be something that happened to me, I'm very transparent with them about my imperfections. 
because I want them to understand that the guy standing in front of the room talking to them is not a perfect person because I realize people relate to you better when they realize they can relate to you. A person that thinks you with all uh, flaws and they have flaws, they're not going to be able to relate to you very well. People listen to you when you say, you know what, don't do this because when I did that, this is what happened. Mm. They'll listen to you a lot more. And oftentimes, even when it's not true, learn how to capture your audience to get them to pay attention to what you're trying to tell them. Right. So what are one of the things that you do, like uh, an icebreaker or something, a way that you would start the meeting um, after opening up with the current event? I think you mentioned something like making them read aloud or, or do public speaking in the yes. meeting. One of the things I like to do is I like to make a PowerPoint of bullet points. Um, and I like for my young men to read those bullet points. And my purpose in making um, these young men read is I want to find out um, weaknesses that they may have. And, you know, it's amazing how when you ask them to stand up and read, you find out the ones that are afraid to talk in public. You find out some that have speech impediments, but you find out bad habits they have, biting their knuckles, twisting their hair, repeating themselves, saying things that aren't in the sentence. If you think about the way young kids write nowadays, everything is about trying to get X amount of characters in. So they talk like that. They read like that. And my job as a coach is to tell them you can't do that in an interview. I understand that preparation can be summed up with prep, but you have to say preparation because that's the way that it's written. You can't sit there with your knuckles in your mouth reading, you know, slow down, stop, breathe. So I'm trying to teach these young men how to present themselves because I realize this. If they've made it this far to me and they're doing this, nobody's ever told them not to. And if I don't stop them, no classroom professor is going to tell them that. Not one in college. So now all of a sudden, this guy could be a three point plus GPA student. But the first time he goes to sit down in a job interview, he starts twisting his hair. He starts biting his knuckles. He's missed out on an opportunity because nobody told him that he shouldn't do those things. If I notice that they have a problem in reading or a problem, I can now contact the academic people and say, we need to get them some help. So I feel like that's a little for me to do in the small amount of time I have with them to be able to correct something that may impact the rest of their lives. Wow. Wow. That, 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 that's, those are some good tips, Coach. I mean, it just shows that you really care beyond winning on the field, like you said before. What kind of things have y'all done um, after all of the race stuff that's been going on with like George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery? Like, have you all had anything where you addressed it with the team? I see that some colleges, the players are boycotting or not practicing because they feel that the university has not addressed, properly addressed the issue with them. No, not at all. I tell you, man, our um, administration from top to bottom here at Texas Tech has been phenomenal. Um, right when uh, everything took place, uh, being the associate head coach, um, I deal with Coach Matt Wells on day to day issues regularly. And. He and I, I was quarantined in North Carolina and he was back here, but he and I got on the phone right away and just talked through these things. And he knew uh, that he had to do something. He wanted to do something. And um, he put out a letter, you know, just to let him know, because the kids were not with us at that time. And um, one of the things that he and I both understood is that they need to see from afar that you understand the seriousness of this problem and that you're with them because so many coaches across America were not speaking up, whether they were worried about the fan base perception or whether they were worried about boosters or whatever it was, but we're not politicians, we're coaches. And our job is to be leaders. And one of the things that I understand is from observation, we look to our leaders for guidance. We look to our leaders for strength. And I think uh, one of the reasons I chose to come work along with Coach Wells is he understands a lot of those things. And, you know, he and I were already on top of a lot of these things before the George Floyd or the Ahmaud Arbery situation ever came about. One of his reasons in hiring me and when he told me was that, you know, he wanted me to be able to help him to understand, you know, how to deal with the minority athletes. And he understood being white and me being black, that there were things that he wanted for me to be able to help him out that he couldn't because he wouldn't understand. So we were way ahead of the curve in that aspect. And, you know, he held a team meeting and talked about it and opened up the floor for people to voice their opinions um, as soon as everything took place. And he hasn't done it just one time. He's done it about every time that we've met. And um, our athletic director uh, took it upon himself to have a departmental 
uh, meeting. And I think it was 140 something of us on a call. And it was about a two and a half hour call where people were just voicing their opinions. And you had people admitting that they didn't know what to say. And you had people like myself trying to explain, you know, what you should say. You don't have to have perfect words. Just say you're willing to listen and understand. So and these are a lot of people with me just being new here to Texas Tech. I've never even met in person yet. And we're faced with an obstacle, you know, like this, that all of us have to be on the same page because we're all responsible for leading young people. And what we did, um, I guess, last week, we were able to go out as a department and partner up with the local community here to march with them in a peaceful march. And uh, we got there and, you know, it was about the violence um, in our own community here in Lubbock, Texas, in addition. So I think the people here are willing. Um, Juneteenth, our president of the university, let everybody off. The athletic director second that and our football coach second. This. So, you know, I've told people all across the country that I'm very glad I'm here because the leadership, they're not trying to pretend that they understand, but they are 100 percent on board with listening. So I'd say that we are probably the perfect model to watch across college sports for how you should go about doing things. So I'm proud to be wow. here. OK. And, and one thing you said, like even with your head coach, when he hired you, knowing that as a white male, there was some limitations with what he could relate to the minority athletes on. What would you say to other people in leadership in regards to empowering people on their staff who are minorities to help bridge that gap? Well, I think, you know, when you start talking about leadership of any kind, the first thing you have to do as a leader is to be able to look in the mirror yourself and say, where am I weak? Where do I need help? That's the number one thing. And when you can accept and admit to yourself that I may not be as strong here as I am here, but I need somebody to help me to be as strong as I can possibly be, that's when you start looking in the right direction. And I think uh, Coach Wells and I are good friends, and we've been friends for a long time. And um, our families know each other. Our wives know each other. We worked together when we were very young. I think he's just a wise head coach in that regard. I think any white head coach who doesn't understand the impact of having black men around young black men, they're naive because there's so many things that we understand, we know, and only we know that's going to help them be better for the program that they just can't teach. There are things that my father taught me that no white man could ever teach me because they've never endured or been through that. There are certain ways I can go talk to a young black man that Matt Wells can't. You know, he could be put into a situation to where he's blamed for saying or doing something that they're going to accept for me. That's just the reality of life. And I think you have to accept the reality of life when you're in those power positions. And I think the coaches out there who understand that are the ones who are starting to hire more people to help get those things done. Nothing in a sport or a situation like this is about playing games on Saturdays only. This is a 365 day a year job. And they're going to be parents that call me. That's not going to call Matt Wells. They're going to be high school coaches that call me. That's not going to call Matt Wells because the way they want to talk, the things they have to say, they don't feel like he can be able to relate to. So I think it's very imperative that you empower people to be able to help you in that regard. And they're out there. But I think what happens in a lot of leadership positions is, especially in college football, because that's what I observe, when head coaches become head coaches, especially prominent head coaches, they become disconnected. They're no longer on the road recruiting as much. They don't do the clinics and the um, clinic circuits as much. Even when you go to the national convention, they're not very visible because they're in demand. Everybody wants a job. Everybody wants to get close to them. So they kind of shield themselves away from everything. Well, you think about it. After five, six, seven, eight years of this, you haven't met a lot of new people. You haven't been around a lot of people. Matt, I'm working for Matt Wells now because we knew each other when both of us were just measly assistants, not making much money at the University of Tulsa. That's why we're friends. We developed those friendships and we maintained those friendships. And the trust became where he knew me more than just a black man. He knew me as a friend. But I think when these guys get into these prominent positions, they cut themselves off from getting to meet new people, from getting to know new people. And I think that places a lot of limitations on us because we don't get a chance to meet these coaches 
when we don't want anything from them or when they don't have positions open. And I think that's kind of what happens. You know, head coaching in my vision is a very lonely place. I mean, it looks good on TV. I know they make a lot of money, but you don't see a lot of with a lot of friends. <laughs> you know, it's just the reality of it because you're in control um, and you hire friends, but you still have to be a supervisor to your friends. And as your friends go on to get other jobs, you're bringing in people that you don't know. And you know a little bit less. You know a little bit less. So you're not taking the vacations with five or six other couples anymore because you don't want your pictures out of having a good time. And that's just what the social media and cameras have done. It's caused coaches to have to alienate themselves from the world, which cuts off their ability to be able to meet new people. Mm. Wow. One um, thing I want to ask you um, when you were talking, it made me think of like when you're talking about what the university is doing with the, the protests and the, the walks and the marches. What about with um, the kneeling for, for the flag? Um, when you think about the NFL and what happened to Col with Colin Kaepernick? And now the NFL is backing off of the original stance that it was completely unacceptable. What are your well, thoughts on that? Well, I think um, what has happened with the whole George Floyd thing in this last three to four weeks of an uproar, I think it's made everybody who tried to use Colin Kaepernick kneeling as an insult to the flag of the United States or as an insult to the military, I think it's made them go back and listen to what he was actually trying to say. If you go back and listen to his tapes, he very, very articulately and clearly said that One second, he should be back in just a moment. Um, I just talking about the Colin, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you, but I can't see you. Okay, let me try to get out and get back in. Okay. Uh, but yeah, with Colin Kaepernick and the kneeling and the Drew Brees situation where, you know, it was said that that was a disrespect to military veterans because his grandfather was a veteran. There's a lot of black people who have grandparents who were veterans. My grandfather was a veteran. Um, we received his flag at his burial service. So there are a lot of black men who gave their lives in the wars to help give us the liberties that we celebrate today. And the flag is honored and respected by black people, um, even though there are things about the, the, the Pledge of Allegiance, things about the Star Spangled Banner that are not necessarily respectful to the contributions that we've made that doesn't necessarily even consider us citizens. There was a time in this country where we were considered three fifths of a human being. These, these are all parts of the, the, the history. So it has to be considered when we're thinking about the, the struggle that black people are still fighting to be seen as equal and have equitable rights. Well, um, I, I think what you're talking about has really opened a lot of people's eyes to listening to exactly what you just said. You know, when you look at a guy kneeling, and you're on the other side, it's easy to join with the mob and say, well, you know, he's just being disrespectful. And nobody wanted to listen. And there were so many people that were afraid to join with him because you're afraid of your job. You're afraid of losing your position. You're afraid of how you're going to be viewed. You're afraid of you losing your um, status because, again, you have mouths to feed. You have responsibilities that you have. And I think what he did was he sacrificed himself to be able to raise awareness. But because these things continue to happen, they could no longer be ignored. And the George Floyd situation was the final straw. And even if you go back to the situation, you know, with Drew Brees, the common thing to say is, you know, I don't agree with anybody doing that. But then when Drew Brees were, was attacked by a lot of guys that he respected, he had to listen to exactly what they were saying. And all I think this is doing is just making people take the time to listen to why he's kneeling, you know, why we're upset, why we feel like this. And I've had multiple conversations with colleagues across America about things that have happened to me. They never, they never would have wondered because it's not like we walk around 
with paint on our face or a sign that says I've been racially pro profiled. But, you know, I'm a 46 year old man and I live in a nice neighborhood, but I see people look at me all the time when I go through the self checkout line, you know, because nobody's checking. Yeah, I see the looks. You know, I may go in there with some sweats on. I, I'm not. Now, if I were to go in and say it that I worked at Duke University, nobody would say anything. But because they see me come in and you see the stairs or whatever. But I think that's just common to do when you see a black man with stuff going through like that. But what we're trying to do now is to make people understand we do see these things happening. And these things happen on every scale of life. And when you start listening, it makes people kind of take a look in the mirror. So you don't see as many people talking about the kneeling aspect of it anymore as they do. OK, I'm understanding why the kneeling was going on. All Colin Kaepernick was trying to do and I commend him for it, was to give us a voice, you know, to give everybody a voice. But more than anything else was to get people to lend an ear to see why. And right. I think all of this stuff was kind of put together because as we're crying out, things are still happening. And now we're saying, OK, this is what we're talking about. Whereas a lot of those things happened in the past and they were just ignored. They were not put on the news. They were not put on social media. And thank goodness for social media now, because we've got a platform to be able to say, OK, this is what we mean. I'm by right. no means a militant person. I'm the nicest person you ever want to meet. I like white people. Some of my best friends are white. But at the same time, I am a black man with black kids. So I do fear for my own life and I do fear for my daughters because of the color of their skin. You know, I'm curious as to now that how do we teach people how to get arrested? How do we teach people how to get pulled over? What are you supposed to do? Please give me rules on what I'm supposed to do when I get pulled over because I see people get shot and it started off as a general conversation. So these are all things we're just saying that are happening to us that don't happen to other races. And like I said, I'm pretty sure if you gave Hispanics a voice, they would have just as big of a complaint. But everybody needs to listen in order to better yourself. And that's all the point we're trying to get across. Right, right. And now people are saying that they're going to give Kaepernick a chance or an um, tryout, perhaps. And to me, it's like that window of opportunity has passed. And I compare it to what happened with Muhammad Ali after he was exonerated or, you know, won his trial after sitting in jail and um, being out of boxing during the prime of his career. So you, you do that and you give him a chance, but now he's not the player that he was when it happened. I 100% agree with you, but I'm a faithful person and I believe God works in mysterious ways. I truly do. I, I truly think Colin Kaepernick's stance um, will forever be remembered. And I, tr I truly think he will ever be um, compensated for that. You know, mm -hmm. I hope. And I envision Colin Kaepernick being an ambassador for the NFL about racial injustice. And he will mm -hmm. garner a salary without having to get hit, you know, and he'll be able to do this a lot longer than he did. You know, even if you look at Muhammad Ali, he missed some very, very critical years. But up until the end of his life, you know, he was still garnering checks and royalties for his family for being an ambassador for the United States. And, you know, there have been other people that have made, you know, those same sacrifices. And I think the appreciation of people for what Colin Kaepernick has done is going to pay off at some point right. in time. You know, I hate the fact that he didn't get a chance to, you know, live out his career and, you know, maybe earn a chance to uh, win another starting job somewhere. But I really believe this. I think Colin Kaepernick's purpose is as big as the purpose of Martin Luther King. I think Colin Kaepernick's purpose is as big as the purpose of Muhammad Ali. And I do think that young man will be remembered just like those people because we're living right now and we don't realize or see how profound that is. But when you take a history book 40 years from now, there's not gonna be many bigger things than him deciding to say, you know what? I sacrificed the popularity. I sacrificed the money for what I believe is right. And I truly believe that young man had to feel like God and Jesus was on his side for him to do that because he, en he endured a lot. He really did. To have owners call you out, to have politicians call you out and to still stand firm, to never lose your composure, to never say or do anything to give people ammunition to use against you other than I just want equality and justice. He strengthened people. He strengthened me to be able to do that. And because he strengthened me, I was able to strengthen other people. So he started a domino effect. And even though, you know, 
the strength didn't show until a few months ago, and he did this in 2016, he will never be forgotten. Wow. And that's a lesson to everybody that delayed effect. You know, sometimes we don't see the, 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 the fruits of what we're reaping when we're, when we're doing it, but it takes that, like you said, four years later for him to actually see, because some of us will be like, well, this isn't working. I'm sacrificing for nothing. I need to just go ahead and agree and, and, and fall back on what I'm standing for to fit in with what society wants so that I can get this money so that I can get this notoriety. But he stood firm and now he's, four years later, he is going to be remembered forever, like you said, because he stood up and had integrity for what he believed in. He did. And what he did was he. Nobody forgot what he did. And although he was scorned for it, although he was attacked for it, you're seeing those same people now have to what? Come back and apologize to him for it. Those same people are having to say you were right. We were wrong. But. How many people did he strengthen to use their own voice? You know, that one video that those young men in the NFL made is what ultimately got the apology to come out. Had it not been for Colin Kaepernick, you wouldn't have saw young, prominent young men coming together to do that. So he was the start to something to strengthen other people to be able to use their voice. Because I think whether you're black or white, you have to realize that when you have a certain status level, you have a voice and we should all use that voice for positivity. And I stand firm in saying that Colin Kaepernick used his voice for positivity. Colin Kaepernick never said violence. He never said looting. He never said robbing. He never said stealing. He never said to do anything other than stand up for what you believe in. And what he's done is stood firm on that. He has never wavered from his stance. And, you know, he was the talk of the town for a long time for the wrong reasons. But now you see people having to come back and coaches are starting to say now, well, maybe I'll give him a chance. And we realize that he's not going to be the same Colin Kaepernick that he would have been had he not missed those years. But I think the purpose is big. And like I said, I envision and I hope and I'm not going to call myself a prophet, but I hope to see Colin Kaepernick as a high ranking official in the NFL for double digit years to come. And people can reflect back upon and say, OK, this is the guy that got us racial justice. Mm. Wow. Powerful coach. Yes. Yeah, someone says the spark. Damon says he was the spark. Yeah, he was the spark. A spark is someone that sparks and sprouts change. Right. Yep. And, and, and every change has to have that. And, you know, he was right. um, in a situation to where he did. Like I said, take a lot of bumps and bruises um, from account of it. He lost a lot of money um, at the end of the day. But right now, there's probably not a more respected person in the United States of America than him, mm. other than mm. possibly Barack Obama in that sense, amongst black people. And like I said, mm -hmm. I'll be telling my grandchildren about Colin Kaepernick, and I'll be proud to do so. Wow. So at this time, I want to open it up if anybody has any questions for Coach Jones. And while we're waiting to see if anybody has a question, Coach, do you mind sharing a quote or two from your book, Always Play to Win? Any sure quotes thing. that stand out to you? Yeah, sure thing. My favorite quote is everything you do in life is an interview because you never know who's watching or what they're looking for. And I stand mm -hmm. firm on that quote, whether you're male or female, because that's a fact of life and it's going to be a fact of life until the end of your life. You know, how you dress, how you talk, what you say, what you do is always being observed by somebody because you never know when that's going to come back around. Wow. And how can people get a copy of your book? Um, you can order the book from Amazon or you can also order the book from AP2W.com. Um, if you want the book signed, uh, order it from AP2W.com because I can't sign the ones from Amazon. They mail those directly to you. Okay. Wow. Well, I can't wait to get my copy of AP2W. And he always used the hashtag AP2W. Um, always play to win, whether it's in, in, in life or, or in football. But football, you know, mirrors life. Yeah. So. And like I said, AP2W is just a platform for life, period. And, and what it simply means is um, live on the side of positivity because nothing positive comes from being negative. And, you know, you must understand in life, you're going to fall down at times and falling down is a part of life. But that doesn't mean that you have to stay there. You know, we have to learn to get up in order to learn from our failures. And 
you're going to be dealt with adversity. You're going to not be liked. You, people are not going to always agree with you, but you've got to believe what you say and you've got to stay true to who you are. And I think if you are a walking example of positivity, your days will be a lot brighter. You know, I'm one of those people. I don't have bad days. I refuse to have them because I don't know how many I have. You know, it can be a losing my job. It can be something happening to somebody, but I'm going to find the positive in that because it just feels better. You know, you think about when you get upset and your whole grudges, that feeling you get in your throat and how tight your face is, that don't feel good. And most of the time when you're upset and you're mad with people, you suffer from it more than they do. If somebody right. makes you mad or upset, they knew what they were doing to you. So guess what? They're not suffering from it. You know, I, I put up a quote the other day and I'm like, it takes a lot of energy to dislike somebody. It really does. I couldn't imagine how much energy it takes to hate somebody. I'm just not going to give nobody that much of my attention. <laughs> you know, when I look at it like that, I'm not going to be walking around in my house that upset with anybody because that just doesn't feel good. And for me, it's really about understanding the blessings that we all have. And that's the blessing of life. And as long as I wake up every day and um, I get a new day to explore the world, to experience the world, I just look at it as if I don't have many things that I can complain about. So I try to be a walking example of just that. Wow. Well, thank you so much for, number one, being a walking example and for blessing the lives of so many of our youth, uh, because we need positive, strong leaders like you. Um, I'm a mother and I want my son to play for someone who cares about them off the field as much as what you're describing. I don't want him to just be seen as someone that can run a ball and, you know, run fast or jump high and, you know, score points. And then once he's done playing, that he's disposable. I want somebody that actually cares about his success off the field and in life after football. So thank you so much for everything that you're doing for our young, our young people, male and female. I saw a post you did the other day and you awarded some scholarships to females. Um, not, I don't even think it had to do with athletics, but you awarded scholarships to I saw three females. Yeah, well, um, what I'm able to, able to do, and again, I go back to just blessings. You know, um, when I wrote this book, um, naturally, I didn't know exactly what was going to come of it. And what I did was I paid for the publishing myself because I didn't want to owe anybody anything. And um, the book sold really well you know, when it was released and what I wanted to do, I had a teacher um, in grade school that was always an influence on me and she was dying of cancer. And what I did was I was asked to speak at her funeral. And what I did was I asked her daughters if they would allow me to start a scholarship in her honor. And um, I didn't really know uh, how big and impactful it was going to be. But being from a small town, I realized a lot of people need financial assistance. And for me at that point in time in my career, I was blessed to where I didn't need the money nor the proceeds from the book to live. So what I've been able to do is I started on a very small scale and I've just been able to take every single dime that we've made off of this book and my speaking engagements to give back to people in my community. And uh, we actually just awarded our eighth scholarship um, to people in our community. And what we've done is we've been able to start an AP2W professional development program for four young ladies and just trying to teach them and expose them to things that they would not normally see in the community. You know, um, you don't want people to be restricted from a, achieving their goals because they don't have the finances or the resources to do so. And because I do know so many people and because I do have avenues to be able to open doors for them, I'm trying to share that. So there's no better feeling for me than to be able to go back to my hometown and to see the smiles on their faces and you um, rewarded them the scholarships and I was able to take them to brunch the other day and just to be able to hear a little bit of their stories, you know, where they come from, what they're about and what their ambitions are. You know, that's big for me. They look at me and they look at me as a figurehead and a person on television, but I want to know their stories because I walk the same halls of the same high schools that they did. And I tell them all the time, the only thing I want in you from you in return is to be able to give this knowledge and to be an example for somebody else. So again, it's just a blessing from God. And I'm thankful to everybody that has purchased this book. I'm thankful for everybody that has listened to me or paid me to speak because I've been able to give that back. And it's truly making a huge impact in my community. Wow. Thank you for that. And, and I just want to reiterate what he just said. All the proceeds from the books and all the proceeds from his speaking engagements go back to giving scholarships to people um, 
from his hometown. So definitely support Coach Jones. I appreciate you, Coach Jones. We have a comment here that says, I will share this video with all of my groups and individuals that I know, great job. So make sure everybody shares this video. Um, a lot of powerful information here, especially if you, even if you have an athlete, this, is, this was a video that can help coaches, but also athletes. Some of the things that he said would help them in the recruiting process and communication with coaches and also when they are on a team, how to carry themselves. So please share this video subscribe to us on YouTube and also hit the bell for notifications. Thank you so much for Coach Jones um, by Always Play to Win at ap2w.com and we appreciate your support. Tomorrow we will be back with Joanna Hayes at 7 p.m. Thank you. And thank you. Bye Coach Jones. All right. Thanks. Thank you.